Good morning. It's Wednesday, the twenty-sixth of June, and this is Govind Raj Athiraj broadcasting and streaming from and headquartered in Mumbai, India's financial capital, but in transit right now. The take for today: Did you know that more than half of households in the United States own mutual funds, roughly fifty-four percent to be specific? This translates to some hundred and twenty-one million investors and some seventy-one million households. Now, this figure has been rising, though steadily, and has. Also been even in some years, but the fact is that it is high. Total assets in U.S. registered investment companies, including mutual funds, exchange traded funds, closed ended funds, and unit investment trusts, stood at around thirty-two trillion dollars as of mid twenty twenty-three. That's last year, and households of this owned about seventy-nine percent, or twenty-five trillion dollars. Now, registered fund assets represented about one fifth of households' financial assets. Now, all of this is from an investment company institute survey last October. The point is that the U.S. is a mature market when it comes to individual investors owning stock, but they do so indirectly, mostly via mutual funds. Also, you have to remember that all of this represents one third of the population of the United States, roughly. And remember, we are only speaking of mutual funds so far. In India, mutual funds are attracting six percent of household savings in India, which is a good start and a sound foundation, and is growing and perhaps has grown quite substantially. In the last couple of years, now this is also happening because there are very few options. Inflation is biting, and people are looking, sometimes quite desperately, to try and earn better returns on their savings. But the moral of the story, the quick one, is to obviously invest institutionally, even if some mutual funds right now in India are facing credibility issues, or rather, one mutual fund. Investing directly, unless you are really confident at peaks, is not a very good idea. Institutional investors, domestic and international, particularly those with pedigree, and it doesn't take long to find them out, blend science and art. And of course, the best ones have patience, as I've seen. It's the patience to see around corners, to stay fixed on the long term, even if they enjoy the short-term rides, as perhaps many are right now. And our top stories and themes for the day. Institutional investors are wading in, sending markets to new highs. The BSE Sensex hits seventy-eight thousand. Nvidia cracks. That's a warning signal for overheated Indian stocks as well. Where India stacks in the emerging market universe right now. Oil prices are still holding high. The big tension on GST between what the government wants and what taxpayers would like to pay. And Qatar Airways is the world's best airline. Vistara is India's best. This is a core report with Govind Raj Athiraj. The markets scale new peaks. The markets in India hit fresh all-time highs in trades on Tuesday, led by a strong rally in large-cap private banking shares. The nature of this rally suggests, though I might be wrong, that more institutional investors are buying, including overseas ones, returning ones perhaps, because they prefer banks and big caps and big names. The Sensex rallied past the seventy-eight thousand mark for the first time and registered a top of seventy-eight thousand one zero five, and finally closed up seven hundred and twelve points at seventy-eight thousand fifty-three. That's almost a percent. NSE Nifty Fifty was up above the twenty-three thousand seven hundred level, touched twenty-three thousand seven thirty-five, and closed at twenty-three thousand seven twenty-one, or up one eighty-three points. Interestingly, the broader BSE mid-cap and small-cap indices have slipped. They were down only about 0.26 percent and 0.03 percent, which is barely any movement. World markets get a lesson in gravity. Nvidia Corp shares entered correction territory on Monday as an ongoing sell-off took out a historic amount of value for the AI-focused chip maker, according to Bloomberg. Now, the stock price of Nvidia as of Tuesday is set to rebound, but the drop should be an object lesson to those who believe in one-way streets. Nvidia fell about 6.7 percent, its third straight negative session and biggest one-day percentage drop since April, as compiled by Bloomberg. The three-day drop erased about $430 billion from Nvidia's market capitalization and the biggest three-day value loss for any company in history, according to that same Bloomberg data. Shares fell about 13 percent over the period, past the 10 percent threshold that represents a real correction. This also affected various other chip makers, including Broadcom, Qualcomm, ARM Holdings, and the U.S. listed shares of Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing, all falling between three and a half to almost six percent. 
This drop also puts Nvidia's valuation back below the three trillion dollar mark, and that makes it both under Microsoft and Apple Inc. If you remember, last week Nvidia was the world's most valuable stock. However, even with this slump, Nvidia is up about 140 percent, which apparently makes it the second best performer in the S&P 500. But what Wall Street has been saying across the board is that the scale of Nvidia's rally, which is about 240 percent across 2023 has underlined concerns about its valuation. The stock trades at about 21 times estimated sales over the next 12 months, making it the most expensive in the S&P 500 by this measure. So the moral of the story for India is that there are many stocks quoting at pretty absurd price-to-earning ratios, 50 and 100 and more, and many of those are companies you may not recognize at all. So the point is that valuation is something that is always and will always be a concern, particularly to seasoned investors. And if they start selling or if they start correcting some of their holdings, that could affect prices across the board. So if NVIDIA can take a hit, so can any other stock. Oil holding eye. Oil is still holding near its highest lows in eight weeks amidst geopolitical tensions, which are now on a slightly higher ebb across the world in many ways from Middle East to Russia. Brent crude was trading around $86 a barrel after settling on Monday at the strongest level since late April, said Bloomberg. There is also the prospect of tighter supply in the months ahead. Global markets are set for a supply deficit in the coming quarter, according to the International Energy Agency, which reported this in its June oil market report. Bloomberg says traders will be watching measures of inflation and other economic data this week for clues on the path for monetary policy, which may impact food prices. India in the emerging market story. India is an emerging market when it comes to stocks. What that means is that it's still growing and will grow faster than an emerged one. Well, actually, they don't use that term. The word is developed market. Now, where it stands in the emerging market universe at a point of time also determines how funds will flow from overseas investors as they have over the last three decades. With the elections over and a new government in, which is, of course, mostly the old government with some new flavors, the stock markets are back on even keel, at least on that score, as we can see. Foreign portfolio investors who are usually hesitant to play on government formations have now returned to the markets, and it's quite evident. Figures also show that they are back to net positive buying, though for the year, that's 2024, as an aggregate, they're still net sellers at this point. So how are flows it looking and what's driving portfolio investments into India and what is the stack of options looking like from their perspective? I reached out to Jay Kothari, Vice President at DSP Mutual Fund, who speaks to investors world over all the time. And I asked him to give us a status check on what he was seeing and hearing at this point of time. So in terms of the sentiment, it's not changed too much. So it was constructive to positive even before the elections and before this cabinet allocation. I would say it's continued to be positive. It is constructive. And both the reasons why is both on an absolute basis and even on relative basis. And what do I mean by that is that on an absolute basis, if you look at the growth earnings pillars, growth continues to remain the fastest growing large economy. Uh, it's stable macro, stable currency. You know, you're seeing policy continuity, reforms continuing. And more importantly, we'll have to just kind of see whether how the execution happens of the key reforms which have been taking place over the last couple of years. And in terms of even the uh, India being home to one tenth of the global unicorn also helps in terms of the new companies kind of coming in the entrepreneurial culture. So net net, India is slated to be the third largest economy and the stock market in the next couple of years. So on an absolute basis, it stacks up well. Even on a relative basis, uh, again, and this is on a lighter note that you know lack of better choices. So you know within emerging markets, there are not too many choices, which is kind of you know helping India in terms of the obvious investment choice, which is not a bad thing or a bad outcome from India's specific point of view. So I think it's the cleanest growth story within the emerging markets, and hence kind of continues to remain positive. Right. Okay. So if you were to look at flows this year until June, we actually are at a negative. We saw a lot of uh, outflow earlier and in the month of June, after the election results were out, I guess, buying is picked up. So, I mean, what do you feel is the strategy that large institutional investors are following? No, absolutely. So in terms of flows, I'll you know further break it down into domestic and foreign flows just for the benefit of everyone. So domestic flows continues to remain positive, has been positive since 2016, uh, since 2016 post the demonetization. And what was very interesting, and this is a number which one should keep in mind, is that the average flows from 2016 has been $14 billion in flows from a DII point of view. And the same number from an FI point of view, it's around $5.4 billion. 
and DIs over the last three years have averaged twenty six billion dollars, whereas FPIs is probably near you know one to two billion dollars. And you know you saw massive negative flow even in uh, you know two thousand twenty to two thousand twenty three. So I think from a going forward point of view, a volatility in global flows probably continues is because of the changing dynamics of global macroeconomics, geopolitics, the currency, the FX volatility, etc. So that is kind of impacting India and more so in the rotation. So, you know, a lot of large investors are kind of playing the tactical calls on whether kind of shifting to China, etc. But net, if I were to take a guess, I think FPIs are a much larger pool. And eventually, when they come back, it is uh, going to be with a vengeance. So I think, you know, it is going to be a, a positive momentum over the next two to three years, both from an equity and a debt point of view. And what are the kind of sectors you see them focusing on? What kinds and in which or rather what themes? So I think some mix. So, uh, you know, from banks have been slightly kind of more nuanced in terms of their approach. So, but, but banks incrementally probably sees some momentum, autos, pharma, IT. So whichever sectors which have kind of gone through their down cycle and probably could see an up cycle, you know, those are the sectors and plus where valuations are more palatable than the others. Because, you know, one thing you can't uh, take away from the Indian market is it's slightly, you know, perceived to be more expensive and we completely agree with that few sectors and stocks are trading at kind of multiples which aren't comfortable. But there are a few other stocks and sectors where you can kind of find your bargain and there is where one should focus on. So in terms of types of stocks versus valuation, uh, you mentioned some broad themes and I mean, I'm, I'm still sticking to themes. So in some areas, for example, let's say IT sector or FMCG, we've seen stocks come down because of problems within their sectors, as in obviously demand slowdown and so on. So that does not seem to have changed or is there a perception that that's changing? No, it is going to be eventually a more a kind of sector specific approach and I think what has changed after the election and what's the hope is that the narrative stocks will kind of be more nuanced, controlled going forward versus, you know, the relentless up move which they had seen. So it is going to be back to uh, kind of fundamentals. It's going to be back to reality, which is a good thing in a, in a market which was kind of moving uh, one way where, you know, people were blaming technicals or liquidity to for, for the up move in stocks. But this gives a pause and, you know, gives uh, respect to the fundamentals, which is something which active managers should be more comfortable with. And how's your outlook looking ahead, uh, Jay? Uh, you know, in let's say we are in the middle of the uh, year. We are exactly in the middle of the year, actually. And if you look at the next one or two quarters, how do you see flows? Are there any sunrise sectors that people are looking at, whether it's DIIs or FIIs? No, so I think DIIs, in my personal view, I think that should continue because that's more a structural kind of uh, story, which has kind of gained momentum post the uh, demonetization. And I don't think that's kind of falling apart. And plus, investors have gotten only smarter over the last couple of years where every market fall has been taken as a buying opportunity or at least add to their SIPs, which is which is heartening to know. As far as FPIs are concerned, now that the election and all the uh, kind of noise around it is now behind us with, with no major change other than, you know, the lower majority which uh, incumbent government got. But having said that, with the ministry being stable, with the continuity in terms of policy, we feel eventually India flows will come back with a vengeance. And personally, when on ground, when we look at the sentiments, it's uh, positive in the sense that people have started doing a lot of due diligence on India. They're doing a lot of kind of uh, work on sector stocks within India. And while valuations can be one of the sticking points, broadly, they want to allocate. And the good part about this is that the positioning is very benign right now. So both on a global funds, which are underweight India by 200 basis points, and even on emerging market funds, which are uh, barely 100, 200 basis points overweight versus the 5, 6, 7% overweight they can kind of be. And hence, I think uh, net net, the stage is set for uh, continued flows, both global and locally, even though you could see near term disruptions at times or bigger the events. And so when you talk to investors overseas, uh, how are they looking at the whole emerging market set class? Is it, I mean, how emerging is it? Is it, you know, early emerging, medium emerging, late emerging? Where are we right now? No, absolutely. So I think one thing is certain and, you know, we have a very interesting slide in our presentation, which when we present to global investors is that one thing is certain emerging market Asia will continue to gain market share in terms of global growth and GDP in terms of the overall component. So that pie is going to grow. So there is no, no doubt that, you know, one should focus there. Within emerging markets, it's a tricky aspect in terms of where you go. So our very uh, uh, convincing view is that one needs to take a country specific kind of view and not a broad brush emerging markets because within EMs, there's a lot of kind of country weight which you don't want to necessarily take exposure to. And again, without going into 
too much specifics very broadly in terms of, see, within uh, emerging markets, China is one where global investors are slightly more nervous in terms of incrementally putting their money. So they're definitely not, not probably not cutting weights, but not incrementally putting money. The other regions, whether it's Indonesia and Brazil, they probably get impacted if there is a global slowdown, if the Fed is too late in cutting rates, and if there's a recession which comes through, and because of the US dollar strength then yen weakening, if there is a slowdown in terms of the demand, these countries do get impacted, so you want to stay away from that. Uh, within tech, Korea and Taiwan do well. There are three themes and probably 12, sector, 12 or 13 stocks which you can kind of choose from. So limited opportunity, but still countries where you can bet your money. And India is a no-brainer from a lot of interactions we do. Again, valuations remains a sticking point. But just last point on that, we, we urge them not to just look at the starting multiple, but also look at the kind of earnings multiple. Because in 2023, you started with a 19 or 20 times P multiple, only to realize that your returns on market was 20% as well, because the earnings were 22%. So I think you need to take it in the context rather than kind of just look at uh, pure one number and take a call on the uh, markets. Right, Jay. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you, Gaurav. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening and your support for The Core Report. We've been streaming for a year and we think this is a good time and ripe for a quick feedback from you on what we can do new and better on this podcast. And thank you as always for some good critical feedback. The link to a short survey is in the show notes. Qatar Airways is the world's best airline, Vistara, India's best. If you're a frequent flyer, you will stay with me on this till the end. For the eighth time in its 25-year history, Qatar Airways, with a fleet of about 230 aircraft, has been named the world's best airline by Skytrax in what CNN calls the Oscars of commercial aviation. The prize is in recognition of the quality of service it offers to passengers and a modern fleet, said CNN. Tata and Singapore Airlines' own Vistara was named Best India Stroke South Asian Carrier. Singapore Airlines itself came second to Qatar in the global ranking, though it was first last year. One interesting thing about the top 10 ranking, there is no airline from North America. So Dubai's Emirates was third, that's after Qatar and Singapore Airlines. Japan's All Nippon Airways was fourth and Cathay Pacific was fifth. The UK-based Skytrack said the votes gathered from surveys of more than 21 million customers from 100 countries, about 350 airlines, were the closest run since the awards began in 1999, requiring a recount, according to CNN. And I'm sure the term recount or the process is not something unfamiliar to folks here. Other prizes include Singapore Airlines for the best cabin staff, which also won best first-class service and best airline in Asia. AirAsia, also present in India, was once again crowned the world's best low-cost airline, which apparently it's won for every year since 2010. Ethiopian Airlines was Africa's best for the sixth year. Turkish Airlines was Europe's best. And back to America or North America, who would you think got the best airline prize? Well, it's Delta Airlines. The pending agenda on goods and service tax. So what are the big and pending goods and service tax issues from industry's point of view? Well, the recent pronouncements or announcements touched on some possible waivers on penalties and interest on old demands, as well as a whole new extremely, what I would call, micro-rate adjustments like services offered by railways, hostels, milk cans, cartons, and solar cookers. And they're also diverse and wide that each of them suggests, as I said the other day, that a specific lobby has triumphed rather than merit. Anyway, just to remind us all, GST came into effect only in 2017, and I would argue has got progressively more complex and challenging to navigate every month since then, it would appear. Anyway, so I reached out to MS Money, partner at Deloitte India, and I began by asking him for the unfinished agenda, as well as the tension, if you want to call it that, between what the government wants, which is to protect its revenues, and the interests of taxpayers who obviously do not want to pay higher than what they perhaps deserve to. See, the reason why rate rationalization is very important in GST is in a few days, a week from today, we step into the seventh year of GST. And since the time GST started, we realized that the rates that we have compared to many of the other countries which have a similar GST system, we have far too many rates. So we have a 5, we have a 12, we have an 18 and we have a 28. In addition, we also have a 3% which is for precious metal. We also have a compensation cess over and above the 28%. 
So effectively, all these rates, what they mean taken together, is that the complexity of GST increases. And GST, since the time it was introduced, was always touted as a good and simple tax. In order to bring simplicity, one key aspect is we need to have fewer rates so that whenever someone wants to pay GST or someone wants to know what is the rate of GST on my products or my services, you just have to look at it very simply and say, am I at the mean rate? Am I at the merit rate? Or am I at the sin goods rate? That's it. So that is the reason why rate attribution becomes very, very critical. It has got delayed, I would say, because of the two to three years that got lost in the pandemic, during which it was very difficult to make a policy around a transaction tax like GST. But now that we have come overcome all of those, the GST collections are very, very stable. This is possibly the right time where we start bringing down the number of GST rate slabs and putting them in some very clear buckets where people find it very easy to decide what is the GST rate applicable to their products or services. That's why this is a super critical task in my opinion. The sense I get when I look at the announcements and the statements that are typically made after those meetings between the center and the state governments is that it looks like a long journey. So my question, however, is that are there any intermediate steps possible? Because there are so many classifications now across so many categories. And that too, this is something that we've created in just six years. Is rolling back feasible, at least in the near term? Very difficult, but I would not ideally advocate any intermediate step in terms of rate rationalization, because that would only make things more complex before they become simple. So we need to look at, there is already a committee that is looking at it. This committee has presented a report earlier. I believe the committee is presenting working and planning to present a report again at the next GST Council meeting. So maybe we need to have to wait. We would need to wait for a few months in order to ensure that the report of the committee is considered by the GST Council and they move ahead with it. Because look, whatever race we agree upon, are going to remain in perpetuity. This is not something that we tinker every year or every two years. And you would have also noticed that unlike the other taxes, GST does not figure in the union budget where many changes happen every year. So when something changes in GST, it is for an extended tenure of period, much more than the budgetary period. And therefore, we need to approach it very cautiously, keeping in mind that this is going to be the rate which will apply over the next few years or so. Right. You mentioned that, you know, we are at collecting or our collections are at all-time highs in that 170,000 crore a month range now. Now, the question is that from both points of view, one is as a GST payer, my concern would be that if rates are rationalized, I may be pushed into a higher category. From the government's point of view, the concern could be that, you know, that people who are paying higher will pay less which could cause a loss to the exchequer or could cause, uh, let's say, some kind of disparity. So how would you look at this kind of, a, uh, let's say, dynamic? That's a very good question. And that is, I believe, one of the key concerns on which the government and the committee that has been formed looking at it. To some extent, this problem may not be as large as we think it is. Essentially, because when we do a rate rationalization, we are looking at possibly a removal of the 12% GST slabs that we have now and also looking at changing maybe the 18% slab and the 5% slab. Possibly the 18% slab may come down by 100 or 200 basis points. The 5% slab may need to go up by 100 or 200 basis points. But the key point is that the 12% slab that we have today, which might go away in future, has very few products which are covered by it. The largest number of product classification is covered in the 18% slab. Very large number of products, most of the manufactured items sit in that slab. That is the area of concern. And since the number of products covered by the 12% slab are relatively fewer, there may not be such a big disruptor for business as a whole. Got it, Mani. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you very much. My pleasure. That was The Core Report with me, Govindraj Ethiraj. Do stay connected with more of our coverage at The Core. You can check out our website or sign up to our newsletter for our exclusive stories, one in-depth feature a day on www.thecore.in. 
Do also track us on LinkedIn, where we usually post synopses or extracts of our top stories and interviews. We would love your feedback on how we can make business more interesting and relevant, including, of course, India's vibrant manufacturing sector. So write to us at feedback at the core dot in. And thank you once again for listening.